I am recording this and the recording is on. And let's get the show on the road. So um, before I get the show on the road, I would like to just share a little bit for those of you who have never heard me speak before or who are just coming on for the first time um, and have not seen me um, before, I would like to say um, just a couple things about who I am. So I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm also the managing director of the Lighthouse Arabia, which is a mental health and wellness center in Umm Sukaim. We have lots of different things that we do there. We have, it's one of the largest clinics in the region. Uh, we have mental health certification that we do every month. So if mental health is of interest to you, or you do find yourself maybe being one of those listeners that constantly is being turned to, and then you're like, oh, I don't know what to do with this. I would really recommend taking this evidence-based course. It's in 23 countries. We are the only licensed provider in the UAE for that. And we do it once a month. We also have it for teens, so teens can support each other. We also have it for parents. Um, that one is not online just yet, though, but I just wanted to let you know that we do provide this. Um, we actually serve um, all sorts of, you know, all the way from, you know, prenatal all the way through the elderly. So if it has to do with mental health or your um, well being, we probably do it. And if we don't do it, we will find someone that does it. One thing that I do want to highlight because, you know, you guys are all, you could be anywhere, but you're here with me because you obviously are concerned about your sleep or you want to know more about your sleep, or maybe you're just struggling with some, you know, wellness sort of issues, I would say that please look at our support groups because we have support groups. We are one of probably the biggest houses of support groups if in the region for sure, if not globally. We have about 19 support groups running at this time. We have a very, very big initiative um, when it comes to the community when it, and support groups, and these are free of charge. Um, and we have one for teens and we have one for single parents and we have one for motherhood in COVID. We have one for prenatal, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's so many different things that we address there and they are led by psychologists. So unlike other support groups that are led by community members, ours are actually led by psychologists. So it's quite a containing environment. Um, so I really, really would recommend that you look at that or you go on our website, which is like up to date by the minute. Um, um, and our calendar actually has all of that stuff. All of our Instagram and stuff also has that. So having said that, um, I would like to now move into um, what we are talking about. And this is our team, but I already mentioned to you guys about my team. So what if I told you that there was a power elixir that, you know, powerful, powerful elixir that you could drink and that you could go get somewhere in the world that actually improves your immunity. It reduces your blood pressure. It improves your immunity by 70%, by the way. It reduces your chances of getting any type of dementia or Alzheimer's or any type of memory problems that you might have later in life. It improves your reproductive health, whether it's your sexual health or your ability to uh, reproduce. It actually helps you manage your weight. This elixir helps you be more creative. You're a better problem solver. For sure, you have better mental health. It reduces your risk of depression, anxiety. You actually look better when you drink, drink this elixir. You actually look like you're glowing and you look uh, rested. And you basically de-risk every physical disease right? I mentioned blood pressure and heart disease and, and, and. What if I told you that such an elixir existed? What would you do? Would you say, yeah, okay, yes, tell me what it is. I'll take it. Well, that basically is sleep. Now, most of us think of sleep as something that is rest. Go rest, right? And I want to spend the next hour basically putting that idea to rest. I don't want you to think about sleep as rest. Sleep is a highly, highly active state. Think about it for a second, right? I'm from one of those, by the way, I have to admit that I'm, I'm like a recovering, like, you know, person who was in this camp of I'll sleep when I'm dead. And I realized, um, 
that I'm just borrowing from the future and I'll probably reach that state of deadness a whole lot earlier if I'm not actually taking care of my sleep because now we know so much from research and science and neuroimaging and sleep labs that sleep is actually so critical. But let's just leave all of the research aside. Mother nature makes no mistakes, right? All the things that are not useful to us actually through evolution just phase out. However, Sleep is the one thing that has stayed, but think about it. We're not mating. We're not hunting. We're not eating. We're not protecting ourselves from predators. We are in a highly compromised and a highly vulnerable state. And we've sort of had sleep for eons, right? Through the you know history of man, we have had sleep. And that's the one thing that mother nature does not seem to be getting rid of. So it's either the biggest mistake that mother nature has made, or it is so, so critical to our well-being that when we are so compromised, when we're not hunting, mating, you know, protecting ourselves, protecting our young, we still continue to sleep. So think about that and think about how important that would be. And so I'm going to spend the next hour basically telling you why it's so important to us. I want to talk about the effect of lack of sleep on the mind and body. So I'll talk about cognitive, learning, mental health, immunity. I want to deconstruct sleep for you a little bit because it is a bit of a mystery. Am I closing my eyes? What's happening when I'm in there? And then I want to spend the last bit talking about how to get a good night's sleep. And these are things that I've like really, really worked on. I I think any one of you guys who has heard me speak, even if I'm talking about like parenting, I'll end up somewhere talking about sleep because I just find it fundamental, fundamental to good mental health and to just good relationships and to good, you know, professional uh, abilities, etc. So uh, that's what we are going to talk about today. So let's talk a little bit about the state of affairs, okay? Um, we are basically in a catastrophic sleep loss epidemic. These are words of Matthew Walker, and this is not something that came about during COVID. This was way before that, and this is why so much of the research is coming out, and there are so many illnesses that are increasing in the world, and they're finding that there are a lot of them are actually linked to lack of sleep. Anything less than seven hours is considered insufficient or sleep deprivation. The World Health Organization has labeled night shift as a natural carcinogen. A natural carcinogen is anything that causes cancer. And so it has actually been linked to cancer um, in a way where the World Health Organization can say something like that. The Center of Disease Control in the United States has considered insufficient sleep to be a public health concern. And even when we know all of this, we still consider sleep to be one of those things that is, you know, lazy, um, and there's still a lot of stigma associated with it. There's still people that say, wow, he sent me that email at 1 a.m. He's such a hard worker. Not. If one of my clinicians send an email to me at 1 a.m., the next day they're going to get like a full lecture from me about how they need to be sleeping properly and how they need to be sleeping at a good time. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, the sleep. Sleep being the single most effective thing that you can do for your brain and your body. You know, I do a talk on habits and people are always like, oh God, there's so many habits that I can pick from and which one should I work on? I say work on the habit of sleep. Sleep is at the foundation of everything that you will do. If you are not well rested, everything in your life will be compromised. It is the single most effective thing that you can do for your brain and your body, and I would say for your life and your relationships and your work. Now, sleep is critical, and I'm gonna deep dive into some of these, but I just wanna lay it out on one screen, which is it is absolutely critical for homeostatic restoration, tissue repair. Athletes are obsessed with their sleep. You know, they will say, I need to sleep 10 hours, 12 hours. You know, these old tales that we used to hear that you get taller when you are sleeping. It actually is true. The growth hormone kicks in when you're sleeping. Your immunity is actually stabilizing and strengthening itself. And the natural killer cells are actually working on whatever they're supposed to be working on while you sleep. The glymphatic system, which I will tell you guys about in the next slide, your memory processing, the databases that are being saved and not, and, you know, dumped, all of that is happening in your deep sleep. 
emotional regulation, which is your amygdala, how deactivated it is, is actually re related to sleep, your learning and your creativity. Your slack of sleep is actually linked to obesity, heart disease, diabetes, blood pressure, strokes, cancers, hyperglycemia, poor mental health, higher mortality. You know, there's two heads of states, Margaret Thatcher and um, Margaret Thatcher and um, Ronald Reagan, and they both used to boast about how they used to get four to five hours of sleep and they have so much to do and I'll sleep when I'm dead. Well, both of them actually got Alzheimer's later on in life. And so two of the most feared diseases, right? Two of the most feared diseases in the developed world are cancer and Alzheimer's. Most of us, we're not thinking about dying of typhoid or malaria. We're thinking about, oh my gosh, I'm going to get Alzheimer's or some sort of dementia, or I'm going to get cancer. And they are absolutely linked to your sleep. And like I said, anything less than seven hours is considered insufficient because you're psychologically, oh, I only need three, four hours. But the body, from what I'm going to tell you now, the body actually needs a whole lot more time to do what it needs to do. It needs to heal itself. It needs to repair itself. The insulin needs to regulate. The therm your temperature needs to regulate. All of that is happening when you are sleeping. It's not happening when you are actually awake. And one of the things that is most, most important for me actually I mean I'm like really actually quite concerned and sometimes people ask me you know what is your biggest fear and I think one of my biggest fear is that I might lose my mental faculties you know I want to be able to read I want to be able to engage I want to be able to live a life where I am engaged till my last day and so and I have very, very close family members who have had Alzheimer's and I can just see how devastating that is. And so sleep and cognitive decline, how are they linked? Let me explain to you how that happens. So when you go into deep sleep, not light sleep, not napping, not any of this stuff, when you go into deep sleep, there is a system in your brain, only in your brain, not in your body, called the glymphatic system. Now, deep, when your brain is basically surrounded by all these glial cells, okay, these glial cells actually surround your brain, they literally shrink down and a whole sort of sanitization of your brain happens to clean out all the toxins from your brain. And there's this kind of like power cleanse that happens in deep sleep of your brain. If you do not have deep sleep, this power cleanse does not happen. One night of not getting that deep sleep, you actually have oxidative stress that is built up. And these are proteins, and I don't wanna like bore you with like too scientific of terms, but they are basically uh, two proteins called beta amyloid and tau cell protein cells that actually start to build up and it's like plaque on your teeth like if you don't brush your teeth you know often whatever you might start to feel a buildup right and so that plaque actually builds up builds up builds up you need about eight hours and you need to be able to sleep in that deep state so they actually allowed there was one research study done and i think there's many done actually beyond that but where a study was done where people slept for eight hours but they were actually woken up right before they entered into that deep sleep state. So they were woken up and they were woken up and they were woken up, but they still ate, slept the whole eight hours. The next day they did a spinal cord tap, which is where they measure these beta amyloids and these proteins build up. And they found that there was a buildup of that protein just from one night of not getting deep sleep. Now that kind of stresses me out a little bit because that's just one night, right? And I know that there are mothers, I mean, I have four children, I get it. There were periods in my life where I was not getting that and it was very disrupted, but you, you really need to watch out for some of these things um, and, and find a way around it and work on sleep training your children and all of these other things so that stuff doesn't happen. So cognitive decline is linked to sleep decline, period. And Matthew Walker, who's a sleep researcher at UC Berkeley, he, will, he is basically saying there's a direct link. And for someone who's a researcher to say that, because usually we say there's like, you know, it's, you know, um, correlation, not causation. 
He's actually saying, I'm going to say it's causation. One night of insufficient sleep can increase that plaque in your brain. And it is the most significant lifestyle factor de determining whether or not you will have Alzheimer's or whether you'll have dementia. So this is something that we know now. This is something that is hard science. We are not making this up. This is not like, oh, well, what if? You will have some cognitive decline, whether it may be full-blown Alzheimer's or whether it just be that you are not, your memory starts to fade when you're older if you are not getting that sleep because that plaque does build up in your brain. The second thing is when it comes to learning. Now, I'm a little bit obsessed about my children's sleep. <laughs> you know, at 8.30, like my 15 year old, I'm like on to bed and you know, these blue screen protectors that I'm always harping on about, um, all of this is actually going to be very protective of your sleep. But you know, this is not just about kids. I'm talking about you and me. We need creativity. We need to learn. We need our memory. And so let me tell you a little bit about what happens in deep sleep. Think about your brain's hippocampus. There's a part of your brain called the hippocampus. It actually, it's like a USB stick. You stick in that USB stick to all of your daily memory, right? All of the learning that is happening, your ability to focus, your ability to download stuff into that USB is happening because you are rested and you have gotten sufficient sleep. Then that USB during deep sleep actually goes in and it plugs into your cortex and it consolidates that learning and it saves that learning so that USB empties out into the cortex and now the next day the USB is back empty and ready to learn again. When you are not getting your deep sleep, that USB stick is actually overloaded. So you're like retaining only some of some that what you're learning and you're not saving anything. So you're not retaining any information. You're not able to recall things as clearly. So acquisition, consolidation, and recall are all compromised if you do not get that sleep. You're not able to focus, you're not able to learn, you're basically blocked. That USB stick is full. So like imagine going to sleep and knowing that your USB stick is actually emptying out, that's what happens when you actually get a good night's sleep. Then there's a cycle in your sleep where you're rotating through where it actually is REM sleep. I want you to think about REM sleep as like page 20 of your Google search. So I, when I look up, let's just say frame, right? I might look up frame um, uh, on my Google and out comes all sorts of frames and picture frames and window frames and all sorts of things on page one. It's just things that you would think that when you think of the word frame, something will come up. But on page 20, you will have like sand. And you're like, what does sand have to do with a frame? Like, but you know, you know, maybe it, ha it has to do with the fact that it's, you know, built from glass and glass comes from sand. And so the weirdest associations start to happen on page 20 of Google, which are very something very, very, very different from what you put into the Google search. That's what happens in REM sleep. The weird associations, the remarkable creative insights that were absolutely not possible during your conscious mind or during deep sleep happen in REM sleep. That's where the magic happens. And so poor REM sleep leads to less divergent thinking, which basically is less creative thinking. And they've done all sorts of research on people who pull off all-nighters, dropped literally 40%, 40%. And when I talk about all-nighters, like most of these teens with their phones in their faces, like that is basically them not learning, right? And so what you're doing basically is that you are only 50% present the next day to learn anything new. So then we wonder, well, what's with this ADHD and what's with this, you know, and I actually, if people come for an assessment for ADHD, we will ask how much are they sleeping and are they looking at blue screens without blue screen protectors before they go to bed and, and because too many people have ADHD these days and that actually is linked to their you know, their habits rather than actually a neurological issue that might be a developmental, you know, disorder. 
And so, and they've done research where they've, you know, given people problem solving, um, you know, before they went to bed and then they had them take a good night's sleep and they gave them similar difficult problems during, uh, in the morning and people were like three times more likely to solve the problems faster, better, more creatively when they had a good night's sleep. So if we're thinking about any, you know, professional services or any life problems, like sometimes you're like, you know, I just need to get a good night's sleep and then tomorrow I will work on this. And that's what you might actually need to do because you're just, you get kind of stuck in a rut. I always tell my kids, I also myself, where if I have to do something where I know that I need to really, you know, crack this one, I will think about it before I go to bed and then I will go to sleep. And in the morning, my answer is present with me. Sleep and mental health. Well, let's just say that there's not a single psychiatric problem that doesn't have like a sleep component associated with it. It's whether too much sleep or too little sleep or not enough sleep. So all of that actually is happening, um, you know, due to mental, the mental illness and sleep are actually very much linked. And so poor sleep is linked to increased thoughts of suicide in people that already have mental illness. And so mental health difficulties or depression or anxiety like you, and I'm not saying that, you know, these are people that are completing it, but this is more about like ideation. Like you just, you're fed up of it. And so that's something to look out for, that if you are struggling with these types of really serious issues, then you need to really focus on getting a good night's sleep. They've done research. If you look at the amygdala on the two brains on the screen, you will find that the amygdala, um, where people were actually getting, I think it was four hours or sleep or less, you are 60% more reactive the next day. And I think you guys have all felt it. I mean, I know I felt it where I don't get a good night's sleep, like everybody better be you know, stepping off that day because I'll be kicking the door, the dog, the kid, anything that comes in my way, I'm just going to be so reactive. Like I'm just not a happy person. And you know, you're irritable and you're less likely to reach out to people. You're, you, you, your, your aperture narrows and you become actually quite negative. You start to anticipate and think quite negatively. Like, why did he do that to me? Why wasn't he looking at me? Why didn't he message me back? Why is it all of a sudden you start to misread the social cues? This is science guys. This was proven in, you know, all these research studies that we just um, get this sort of lens on our eyes where we start to see the world very negatively and we actually start to um, uh, feel quite like the world is quite persecutory with us We're like they're against us in some way. Poor sleep is also le leads to poor judgment and poor moral judgment because you end up being quite reward seeking. So for example, you might, um, you know, send the message that you shouldn't have sent, or you might grab the donut that you shouldn't have grabbed because you're on a diet because your willpower actually decreases, your need for dopamine actually increases. And so you're just not going to make very sort of value centered decisions because because you are reward seeking. You're like almost feeling sorry for yourself. And you're like, you know, I deserve this. And that is basically poor moral judgment where we start to feel like victimized, like, you know, and all of that has to do with poor sleep. And then lastly, when it comes to immunity, which is like a hot topic these days, obviously, is that um, one night of four to five hours of sleep, one night, decreases our natural killer cells by 70%. I'll say it again. One night of four to five hours of sleep decreases our natural killer cells by 70%. Okay. I don't know if I said 40, but 70%. So we only have 30% capacity, 70% um, uh, 30% capacity to actually fight the fight of bacterias and viruses that are in the environment. So if you are thinking about your immunity and you're drinking your juices and your, you know, lemon water and, 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 but your sleep is compromised, nothing is going to take effect. They actually found that even the flu shot actually was less effective if you hadn't had a good night's sleep before because the receptors wouldn't uptake based off of the sleep that you had gotten because you actually need the Fit, um, the killer fighter cells engaged with that. You have um, 
there was research studies done with lab um, mice where they actually injected them with malignant tumors and they found that there was 200% growth after just one week of disrupted sleep. This was not that they didn't let them sleep, they just kept waking them up. And then 400 more um, likely to catch a cold if you sleep. So four times more likely to catch a cold or a virus if you sleep five hours or less. There was one study done where, um, where they took healthy women, healthy women, and they had them um, sleep six hours or less, uh, six hours, no, not less. They had them sleep six hours for one week. They measured all of their DNA and their gene expression and all of that. And then they measured them after one week of six hours of sleep. And they found that 700, I'm looking for the number here, but 711 genes were actually compromised as a result. Yeah, 711 genes were distorted as a result of six hours of sleep for one week. I cannot tell you how many people I know that are not getting that seven hours of sleep. So reducing the quality of sleep and not getting the right kind of sleep is going to be very, very critical. So now moving in very, very quickly about just understanding sleep cycles, just so you know that not all sleep is created equal and you do need all kinds of sleep in order for you to function well. Okay. So Stage one, this is light sleep. This is where you sort of wake up and you know, you're sort of dozing off. This usually lasts about seven to 15 minutes or so. Stage two, your brain waves start slowing down and this is still fairly light, uh, but it's almost, like, um, it's almost like one of those nap type of stages where you're not in full deep surrendered sleep, but you actually are still um, you know, in this sort of light phase. So this actually lasts maybe the first 30 minutes or so, and then you move into stage three and four. Stage three and four are the, this is where the deep sleep happens. This is where the magic happens. This is what we should all be really concerned about. And as we get older, this part of our sleep is most compromised. Not sure why, but that's what happens. But this is the stuff that we really need to look out for. Now, and this is where all the things I told you, the glymphatic system and the thermal regulation and the tissue repair and the growth hormone and, 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 all of that happens in stage three and four. And then the REM stage, which is actually really important for creativity and important for problem solving and making associations is actually, uh, and for mood regulation is actually the last part. And you move through these cycles every 90 minutes or so. Earlier in the night, you move, you have longer uh, deep sleep and then later, um, so for example, uh, around 3, 4, 5 p.m. your uh, a.m., you are moving through more REM sleep. So you might have a lot more dreams at that time. And that's why we remember some of those dreams a lot more than the earlier dreams in the night because we're moving through these cycles, but these slow wave cycles are longer uh, or deeper. So um, people often say, well, well, which one should I do? And I think if you had to like compromise on some sleep, you probably should sleep towards the earlier part of the night. I mean, but you know, we need the whole cycle. So the best time to be sort of going to bed is, you know, around 10, 9.30, 10, 10.30, but then seeing it all the way through um, the, the REM sleep. There's some people who wake up super, super early, but you might be losing out on some of that REM sleep because um, the REM sleep is usually the last three hours of your sleep cycle. So if you sh cut those short, then you are compromising on that REM sleep. You have circadian rhythms. These are the things that manage our sleep cycle. It's an internal body clock. It varies person to person. It's controlled by light. And the blue light that we are all on all the time actually impacts the cycle a lot. And that's why you will have me harping on about blue light screen protectors, although that's not like the, you know, the saving grace or whatever, but you sh still should be engaged in blue light screen protectors. So all of these screens that we have actually have a blue light behind them. I know people are like, what blue light? So every single bright HD, you know, screens actually have a blue light behind them. This blue light 
sends a signal to our brain that says, do not release melatonin. It is the same light that most surgeons have over, you know, that bright, bright white light that actually keeps the surgeon alert so they don't like operate on the wrong leg. And that alertness is something that we're engaged with all day long. That's fine if it's like 10 in the morning, not fine when it's 10 at night because you actually need that melatonin to start releasing. And this is before electricity was around, we actually moved with the sun because the circadian rhythms were actually regulated. They're regulated by sunlight and by light. But now because of the artificial light, we actually are quite dysregulated. So we don't know when it's day, when it's night. And so I really recommend to people that if you are um, using these screens, get blue light screen protectors, guys. It's like super, super simple. On my Instagram, I have a sleep highlight and I tell you all about all the different products, but also about the blue light screen protectors and where you can get them in um, Dubai. But I wear glasses, get screens, et cetera. Um, there is an energy dip in the middle of your day, and that is actually linked to circadian rhythms. People usually say it's like food coma or whatever, but it actually is linked to your circadian rhythms where 1 to 3 p.m. Usually you will see a dip. This is when most people drink coffee. Do not drink coffee at this time. This is when you actually just want to go back out for a walk. That would be a good time to get some sunlight or just to get moving. Um, and then 2 to 4 a.m. is usually where circadian rhythms are at their strongest. Just good things for you to know. So what is good sleep? Good sleep actually has a lot to do with the quality as well as the quantity. So it doesn't matter if you just get four hours of rock and sleep. If you're not getting up seven to eight hours, the body still hasn't done what it needs to do to do what it needs to do, right? And so you need about seven to nine hours of consistent sleep in order for you to actually have everything that it needs to get done. You should be able to fall asleep within 30 minutes of closing your eyes. So if you're tossing and turning and tossing and turning, that means that you probably had too much caffeine that day or there's too much on your mind or you're anxious and you need to calm your system down. All of these things could be happening. You could wake up, like usually most of us will wake up once at night and you usually should go back to sleep within 20 minutes. So if you wake up and then like two hours later, you're still looking at the clock, yeah, that's probably not good. And so you should wake up, toss, turn, move back and back to sleep within 20 minutes. And then the biggest indicator of your sleep is actually you just feel restored. You feel like, all right, I got this day. and and you don't need an alarm clock and you're not snoozing and snoozing and snoozing all night, you know, all morning long, uh, just to try to get a little bit more sleep. Um, personally, I have not used an alarm clock in decades because I just rise with the sun and set with the sun. Um, but, but there are people who are snoozing away and that actually is really not good for you. Um, so some of the ways that sometimes people think, well, let me just get a little bit more sleep in, they think that counting sheep helps. Well, it's a myth, it doesn't help. It actually keeps you more alert, so don't count anything. One thing they did find that actually helps is close your eyes when you are sleeping and you're trying to get to sleep, you actually imagine yourself walking in your favorite city and you're looking at all the different things in the city and that's it. And that actually winds you down. So that's one way. Another thing that people, and I, this is something I swear by, but it's not scientifically proven, which is white no noise or ocean. So I can, like, it's very hard for me to sleep without this like fan shh kind of noise. Um, and it's just a habit. It's a psychological habit, most likely, um, because I go to hotel rooms and I don't <laughs> carry a fan with me, although I have asked them if they have one. Um, but most hotels don't. Um, and so I still get my sleep. Um, but if it helps you, more power to you. It isn't necessary. Some people say naps help because I'll make up my sleep. Eh, wrong answer. Naps absolutely will mess up your sleep hygiene completely because there's a chemical in your brain that builds up. So from the morning I wake up and there's a chemical called adenosine that starts to build up in my brain. It starts to build up in my brain. It starts to build up in my brain. If I take a nap, it drops down. And now that pressure 
of the adenosine needs to build up again in order for me to get drowsy. That's why people who nap then sleep two hours later because it takes them that much longer to build up the adenosine in your brain. So do not take naps. Yes, I said it. <laughs> people are like, no, don't take my nap away. Um, people say, well, what if I recover? Like I, you know, hustle all week long and then I like sleep all weekend long. The body doesn't work like that. You might work with your stomach, but sleep is not a bank. You do the damage, you do the damage to your brain and your body. You literally are suffocating your brain when you do that. And so it's not going to just recover. There's no debt that you can pay off. And if you are doing that, you're doing long-term damage to your body, uh, to you know your insulin levels, to your brain um, when you do that. Uh, and obviously the snooze button, uh, every time you hit the snooze button, that cortisol is released in your body, dips and dips and dips of years and years and years of waking up with an alarm system that shoots out cortisol in your, in your body is can actually wear and tear away at your heart. Um, and so you don't want to do that too much. Um, I think if you're like, you have to catch a flight or something at three in the morning, then okay, fine, put your alarm clock on, but really find a way where you're regulated in um, and not having to wake up with an alarm clock. And I know some alarm clocks are like birds chirping, but it still feels like you were jolted out of a place uh, rather than actually waking up slowly out of a sleep cycle, right? You could be in the middle of a deep sleep cycle and then the alarm goes off and then you're like, oh, completely discombobulated. But when you slowly wake up, you actually move out of that deep sleep into REM sleep and back out again. So that's what you want to do to your body. You want to ease into that rather than actually um, sort of jolt yourself out. So just a couple things for you to do on getting a good night's sleep. Now, for people who have to drop off, um, uh, remember I have all of this in my on my Instagram account in one of my story highlights up at the top, I have a section on sleep and I put about all that stuff on there. Uh, and I keep adding to that every time I read new research. So uh, keep look out for that, those things. So what should you be doing to get a good night's sleep? First, stop eating and drinking three to four hours before bedtime. Because when your body is digesting its food, it actually is not going to go into deep sleep. And that doesn't get to do the liver cleanse and the kidney cleanse and the glymphatic system if all of the energy is used to digest your food. So push your meals out. You can have a little bit of a snack like walnuts or something um, in, you know, later in the evening, but push your meals out where you actually are getting them before three to four hours before bedtime. So you're not disrupted with your um, digestion of your food and heartburn and all of these other things that people struggle with. Schedule your caffeine early in the morning. Okay, I cannot say this enough. And I think this is a culture, especially in the Middle East, like everybody's drinking coffee at all hours of the day. Not okay, guys, not okay. Caffeine has an extremely long quarter life. It has a very long half life, but an extremely long quarter life. And if you drink a Diet Coke or if you drink a whatever, you are for sure compromising your sleep. Now I know there's people out there watching this saying, uh-uh, this lady knows nothing actually, because I can go to sleep like this right after coffee. It actually makes me sleepy. You actually will sleep, but that quality of sleep is compromised for sure. And unless you're like an anomaly from another planet, the research shows that you will be compromising your REM sleep and the deep sleep that you could be getting that is restorative. So yeah, sure, you can pass out, but it's not doing what it needs to do. So quality of sleep is compromised. If you drink coffee at 12 o'clock, which many people do, 12 o'clock noon, six o'clock, it's as if you drink a shot of espresso. Okay, at six o'clock, it's like you drank one shot of espresso because two espressos equals one coffee. At midnight, it's as if you drank a quarter of an espresso and then said, now I wanna get a good night's sleep. You're not gonna get a good night deep, like dead sleep, right? Where every part of you just is surrendered and your inside of your body is doing what it needs to do. I drink my coffee at like 5.30 in the morning and then I don't drink any caffeine the rest of the day. 
And that is something um, that I would, I mean, you don't have to wake up at 5.30 in the morning to drink your coffee, but I would say that you must drink it super early and before, like by 10 a.m., you should be done with your caffeine if you really are serious about getting your sleep in order, okay? So um, that's my caffeine spiel. Power up with the sun and turn down the lights at night. So it would be very important when, as soon as you wake up to go outside and, you know, sort of get in the morning sun. A 20 minute walk first thing in the morning is so, so good for the brain. Your brain lights up like a Christmas tree, you're ready to roll. And that the sun is actually powering up your circadian rhythms. It's going to help you at night. So most people think that sleep is something you do, like a good night sleep regimen has to do with something you do at night only. No, so what you do, you know, 12 hours prior to that is actually going to impact you. Are you exercising? Are you out in the sun regulating your circadian rhythms? Are you consuming blue light before you go to bed? If you're doing these things, you can be sure that you're not gonna get a good night the, the quality of sleep that you could be getting. Um, uh, temperature should be about 16 to 19 degrees. And I know people are like, oh lady, that's too cold. Well, there's something called vasodilation that happens. Um, and that could, you know, your body's core temperature actually needs to drop one degree in order for you to get that deep restorative sleep. I don't know. I'm not sure what that's about. But if you can't get your body temperature to drop, set a sleep routine where you actually go take a shower and take a hot shower. When you take a hot shower, the blood vessels on your, um, the surface of your skin actually open up. The blood rushes to the core of the body to, you know, uh, to cool off the body. And then uh, what starts to happen um, is that the core temperature drops. And that hot shower is actually cooling off, it may make you feel hot on the surface, but it actually is cooling off the center of your body, which is what you want to do. Um, you may want to engage in some progressive muscle relaxation, meditation, breathing, like breath work app, which I talked about on my Instagram is really good. Three minutes of just deep breathing can actually bring everything down. Brain FM, which is using binaural beats, which is another app, which I really love, actually uses the binaural beats to put you in a sed you know, sedated state. Um, that would be good. Another thing to do is to use a aromatherapy. Now there's no hard science, but it's a fact that if you have lavender and jasmine, I have pillow sprays and room sprays and things like that, that you can use to relax the body. Think about it. When we go to a spa, no one comes and says, okay, Saleha, please be relaxed. No, they create an ambiance around us where our whole body just moves into this relaxed state. That's basically what you want to be doing when you are actually um, getting ready to go to bed. It is a whole mission, especially in a world that we live in that is so hectic and that is so busy and that is so loud and that is so full of social media and noise and clutter and hecticness. You wanna create a time where you're winding down and that winding down is gonna help you get into that deep sleep. Limit your alcohol because it does disrupt your deep sleep and your REM sleep. Most people say, well, what about a one night, you know, like it just sort of unwinds me. Well, it might be unwinding you, but it actually is disrupting your REM sleep and you are not going to get a good night's sleep if you, so it basically what it does is it knocks out your cortex. So it knocks out you, uh, knocks out your consciousness, but it's not it's not relaxing your brain in any way. It agitates your brain when you drink alcohol too close to bedtime. Use supplements that will help you relax. The MagVita, the Healthy Cell AMPM that I have on my Instagram account as pictures, um, I would highly, highly, highly recommend those. I do not get paid by anybody to say this, but I have tried everything under the sun. And I'm about to try one other product actually, and I will let you know how that goes also. But the MagVita is magnesium, six salts of magnesium. Magnesium has seven. So if you're taking magnesium, 
magnesium um, and you're taking one this and one that, it's, it doesn't get absorbed by the body. The magnesium is extremely difficult for the body to absorb. If you can actually soak yourself in magnesium salts, it is the best way to relax yourself. You can do a foot bath if you don't want to have the whole body in magnesium salts, but the Magvita has B6 and Magvita, and it actually relaxes the body. It's a muscle relaxer that is natural. The healthy cell AM, PM has an AM, one and a PM one, and they actually just help you and they have all sorts of herbs and natural and all of that that help you. People ask me about melatonin. Melatonin has varying de uh, degrees of effects. So anywhere from 80% less than what they said to 475% more than what the bottle actually said. You don't wanna be messing around with your melatonin because you're gonna be super drowsy when you wake up if you don't get it the right kind. And so I think the Healthy Cell AMPM does have a little bit of melatonin, but it's literally like 0. 0.0 something. And so you may wanna consider that. Eat foods. Um, you know, like if you're snacking at night, like have kiwi instead of an apple or have kiwi instead of grapes because kiwi actually has tryptophan or it has melatonin, actually induces melatonin. Almonds, walnuts, tart cherry juice, interestingly enough. All of these actually release tryptophan and melatonin, which actually relaxes the mind and the body. Drink teas that are decaffeinated, uh, that reduce your stress. So I you know, pukka tea actually is one of my favorite teas. It's organic and they use medicinal grade herbs to actually pack it in. And I have to, there are days where I'm like so hyper that I drink like two tea bags. I have the relax and the three chamomile and the nighttime. And I'm like overdosing on that stuff because my body and my mind are so switched on that it's just gonna like impossible for me to wind down. If you can't sleep, get out of your bed because your brain is a very associative device. And if you're tossing and turning and tossing and turning, then your brain starts to learn every night that this bet place is for tossing and turning. So you don't wanna be tossing and turning all night long. Get up, go to the kitchen, go read a book on the sofa, and then come back in. Don't read on your phone, don't look at your phone, even if it has a blue light screen protector, guys. When you look at your phone at night, you are turning the light on. Even though the blue light is off, it's still light. And so you're actually activating yourself and not going. So if you really wanna get your night sleep in order, put the phone far from the bed or not in arm's reach so you don't actually keep looking at it all night long. If your partner snores or is, you know, the sleep temperature is too hot or too cold or any of that, they recommend getting a sleep divorce where you actually sleep in separate beds. And they found that it was actually very healthy for their marriage and it was very healthy for their intimacy to have a sleep divorce because everybody was happy and rested in their own way. And so that is something that even the researchers recommend. So that's all I have for you guys now. I see that there are so many questions um, and I'm going to now answer these questions. For those of you who have to log off, I recommend going on to Dr. Saleha Afridi on Instagram and you can um, message me there and I would be very happy to respond to your question. And if you have a question, then maybe someone else does. So please ask me that question, but go check out the sleep story highlight because I do answer a lot of questions on there. Um, um, yeah. Okay. So um, somebody asked about nicotine. Nicotine actually is activating. Um, and so it will be disruptive to your sleep. So do not smoke before you go to sleep. Deep breathing instead. Okay. So that would not be something we would recommend because nicotine actually can make you more alert um, than um, relax. So it might be relaxing, but it still turns your brain on. The relaxing part might just be that you need to do some deep breathing. Naps, I think somebody asked me that question before I talked about naps. Naps are not okay. Um, can a sleep be a method used to escape your reality? Does oversleeping hurt your mental health as much as a lack of sleep? So one of the symptoms of depression is hypersomnia. So there's insomnia and hypersomnia. 
and and these are both symptoms of depression so some people the way depression shows up in them is that they are in some they become insomniacs right they become restless and they can't sleep and then there are people whose depression shows up as just like hours and hours and hours of sleep where they're not able to just engage with life. And so, yes, it is one of the symptoms we look for in depression. You should not be sleeping 11, 12 hours unless you're like an athlete or an Olympian. Um, and if you find yourself feeling very lethargic and things like that, I would go get some blood work done because it could be a deficiency in your vitamin D, magnesium any of these vitamins, any of these hormones, if they're off, you could definitely actually experience exhaustion. Uh, I would definitely be drinking water all day long. Dehydration and depression, if you Google the symptoms, you will find that there's a huge overlap. So if you are dehydrated, you will actually experience um, the lethargy and the exhaustion and the wanting to not move around and, and be in your bed all day long. Um, and so some of these things I would do. And then if you still are done all of that and all your blood work comes out okay and you're drinking a lot of water, then I would definitely speak to a mental health professional um, because yes, it could be used as such. Um, and it is a symptom of something more serious. Um, is placing the phone on the bedside table harmful for sleep? So, you know, there's, I, I need to actually read about this, but they say anything that has to do with a Wi-Fi is not good for your sleep. And so some, some people that are really, really, you know, strict about these things, they actually turn off their Wi-Fi and they turn off and they put their phone on airplane mode um, and then they go to sleep. And that, that is something that you can consider. Uh, I have to do a little bit more research, but I will do that and I will post it on my Instagram account but they find that the Wi-Fi signals actually disrupt your ability to go into deep sleep. Sleeping pills, um, not okay. Someone said Panadol night, not okay, because you're basically knocking out your cortex. You are not getting deep quality sleep. Actually, for in the US, they're saying that for insomnia, sleeping pills is not the first line of you know, response. They actually will do all sorts of other things before they resort to sleeping pills because sleeping pills actually does not allow for the deep sleep. It literally just knocks your cortex out and you pass out. Passing out is not the same thing as sleeping. So if you are taking it regularly, you will get addicted to it and it will be hard for you to come off, but there is a way to taper off of that. And I would recommend doing my whole, you know, vitamins and tea and lavender and all of these other things to get your sleep routine back in your power. I was someone who was taking uh, sort of sleeping aids. I wouldn't call them sleeping pills, but they were more like a muscle relaxer in order to just wind down and get a good night's sleep. But it became a bit habitual. And that's when I went on this like mission to figure out all the natural ways I can get my sleep back in control, through which I found all my teas and all my vitamins and things of that. So no, not okay, guys, uh, Panadol night. Um, how can you lower your heart rate because of accumulated stress? My heart rate is too high, not allowing me to sleep. The fastest way to turn off your fight or flight, which is the heart rate moving, is breathing. So if your breath is under control, you will bring your heart rate down. So breath work is an app that I would recommend that you do. The fastest way to bring your heart rate down is through deep breathing and meditation. Um, let's see. What is the difference between REM? I think I talked about that. REM sleep is where it's rapid eye movement. Light sleep is what happens first thing. And then deep sleep is the stage three and four where all the magic is happening of the healing and the regulation and end. So you need all these sleeps and you move through these cycles throughout the night again and again. So you go through deep sleep, REM, back to light. Deep sleep, REM, back to light. Deep sleep, and you move through them all night long. In the first part of the night, which is mostly like, you know, not the last th three hours of your sleep, you move through deeper or, or more deep sleep cycles. Uh, so the deep sleep cycles are longer 
and then the REM come. And then the deep sleep cycles are longer and then the REM comes. And then towards the last part of the night, you go through less deep sleep and then more REM, less deep sleep and more REM. And so you want to make sure that you get a good balance and you're not waking up too early and you're not going to bed too late because you need all of those for your circadian rhythms to sort of happen. I will say that, you know, 25% of the world's population are night owls and their circadian rhythms are actually flipped. And so they actually function better at night than they do in the day. It's rare, but it is, you know, one of the things that can happen. And so if that is the case for you, then the night shift actually is the best time. I actually know someone like that. And he's literally like so creative and so engaged when he's working at night and during the day he's just kind of getting on with it and so he's a night owl but some parts of the you know so you just have to figure out what your internal clock is and go with that um done um So some, some people said that I do, I'm, you know, dark room, quiet, no noise, temperature, et cetera, et cetera. I would really recommend, I would want to know what you're doing in the day. If you are eating too late, if you're drinking too late, if there's too much caffeine, if you're not exercising, if you're not in daylight, all of these things, guys, our body is a very sophisticated machine. It is meant to sleep. If it's not sleeping, then we need to think about what we're doing in our day that's getting in the way of that. Sometimes our anxiety gets in the way of that. Writing down your negative thoughts, crumpling them up in a you know, paper and trashing them, research shows that you dump out your negative thoughts and then you go to bed. So all of these things sort of play in with one another and you have to keep doing things. Um, so it's not just what you do like the hour before you go to bed, it's everything before that. You know, the other day I really just wanted a Diet Coke. You know, there are just some days where you're like, oh, I need it. And so I was like, no, I know I'm going to suffer like nine hours from now. And so I didn't. And so these are the things you need to be thinking about is that what are you doing in the day? It is not only what you do at night. Um, so, um, yes, sleeping late and waking up late, probably not a good idea. Circadian rhythms, remember guys, they regulate the deep sleep and the REM sleep. If you sleep late and wake up late, then you've lost a lot of your good stuff in the morning because our brain is highly attentive before um, noon. And then you're losing out on the deep sleep cycles, which are longer earlier in the night. So you don't want to do that. You just want to have a rhythm to your life that is natural. Try to be as natural as possible. Yeah, there are people who are medical students, for example, or there are new mothers or fathers. Fine, there will be periods in your life where you will be more compromised. And so you just need to make sure that your quality is not compromised. Then the quality of your sleep has to be rocking solid. Um, and you need to be able to be able to drop into a deep sleep state. Uh, you need to make sure that you're exercising because when you are a new mother or a medical student or any of these people that have to have these night shifts, you have to become a Spartan in the way you're disciplined about your sleep. And I, like I said, I've been a uh, my doc, a doctoral student while I was having my children. And so I know it's hard to do it, but you have to become almost like, you know, that the next two years of my life are absolutely dedicated to this. So I'm not socializing and I'm not going out. I might go out with my friends, but guess what? We're going out for like breakfast before we're not going out for dinner. And so all of these things need to almost become quite regimented during those years that you're investing in your education or you're investing in your children and growing a family where you move with as much as possible with your circadian rhythms and not be up against your circadian rhythms by staying up till two in the morning with your friends because that's when everyone else wants to go out. Well, that's when they wanna go out that I ain't going out with them uh, because I need to be in bed by 1030. And so people will compromise and, and you will be able to see them for lunch rather than after dinner, before after the kids go to bed. So, you know, I, again, I'm not 
there are some nights where I'm like, okay, you know what, this is going to cost me my sleep. And so I stay out till one with my friends and, and that's okay. But that happens like once in a blue moon and I'm okay to do that. But if you're doing this again and again and again, you're literally borrowing from the future guys. So something for you to think about. Um, so someone said, no coffee, clear. Are there any foods or drinks or, that you would not want? To? Sugar and caffeine. Anything that has to do with these two, avoid. So workout first thing in the morning if you can, and you should not work out at least three hours before bed. So if you're doing all of that, remember you're charging up your body at that point. Cortisol and adrenaline, all of this stuff is happening. You don't want to do that right before you go to bed. Fine, a little nice walk is okay but if you're doing this kind of working out you don't want to do that very close to bedtime you want to do it earlier maybe five o'clock in the afternoon or six or you want to do it first thing in the morning and that would actually be the best time to do it because that's when your you know body actually gets most benefit from it um so someone said how many hours before like i said you should if you you should not have caffeine after 10 30 in the morning or 11. i'm gonna have like hate mail <laughs> sent to me um so um yes that's what i would say no 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 later like 11 a.m is like the deadline of any caffeine all of this like high tea 5 p.m make a decaf do not be drinking that afternoon tea it is gonna mess with you and that was all like traditions and habits that were done way before people knew anything about sleep. So ditch the, you know, high noon or high tea or whatever they're called and, and, and don't have that like English tea or whatever caffeinated tea at that time. Have decaffeinated tea if you are going to do some of those things. Decaffeinated coffee is okay. Um, Fitbit, somebody asked about the sleep tracker. Yes, that would be very good for you to do. There are lots of different sleep trackers. I wear the Fitbit, um, but you can find whichever one works for you. None of these are absolutely 100% accurate, but they give you like some indication. And I'm always like, oh God, what's my sleep score? And I just know that, you know, some nights it's just not right. Like some nights I know I'm tossing and turning and I'm not, um, I haven't, I haven't done what I, and I know, I know for a fact, because I injured my ankle this summer. Um, and for so six weeks, I was off that ankle and I wasn't exercising. Absolutely impacted my sleep. I could not drop into, like I have, I'm like, obviously, as you can probably tell, I have like high, high energy and like that stuff needs to be like released. And so all of that energy is still reverberating inside of me until when I go to sleep, but no amount of chamomile or lavender actually knocks that out of my system. And so um, exercise absolutely impacts the way you sleep fact. Um, so, so some people said that there are music, that, that there's music you can listen to that helps you sort of go into deep sleep. I would actually need to just know the research behind it. Um, it was made with the help of a neuroscientist. Now remember guys, just remember. Our body knows what it needs to do. You do not need to do all of these shenanigans if you are balanced in the way you live your life. And so, yes, if it helps you, continue to do it, but it is not something that you need to do. I don't know how people listen. I actually bought one of these like headbands that you can wear that have like earplugs in them so I could listen to some of this stuff while I was going to sleep. Um, it has like a Bluetooth something or another, but then I'm like, do I want Bluetooth on near my head? all night long? Probably not. And so just if it works for you, do it, but know that it like as natural as you can be. We are human beings. We rise with the sun. We set with the sun. There's a rhythm and a balance to our whole body. It renews itself. It heals itself as long as we just do what it's expected of us, right? Rise with the sun, set with the sun, chill with the sun, you know, be in the sun. Um, avoid chemicals, avoid caffeines, eat right, exercise, move, and then you, and hydrate, and then actually like things just fall into place. So I would really just 
recommend that. Um, okay, did that, did that. Let's see where we are. And well, I can still do maybe five more minutes of questions. Um, okay, so optimal bedtime. So like I said, optimal bedtime would be like 1030 or 10 if you can, like there are days when I have gone to bed really, really early and it's like the best ever. But the earlier part of the night, remember guys, you have longer deep sleep cycles. So if you cannot get the full eight hours, then I would recommend going to bed earlier so your body can do what it needs to do because of those long deep sleep cycles and, and still get you know the tail end of the REM sleep. And that's what I would recommend. So 10, 30, 11 would be the best time for you to go to bed. 11 is like way past my bedtime, actually. <laughs> Power naps, absolutely not. Actually, let me take that back. If you can sleep for 10 minutes, it's okay. If you do anything more than 10 minutes, you are now dropping into your adenosine levels. I just have never met someone who can do 20 minutes. So if you can do it, if you're like a nap ninja, then I would recommend go ahead. But I have never met someone who can just sleep 10 minutes. You know, there are times where I'm like reading a book and I sort of doze off and then I'm like, you know, wake up, your adenosine is dropping. Um, so yes, yeah, somebody asked me about breath work, um, uh, breath apps, check my Instagram. I recommend an app that I really love. Um, a doctor suggested three milligrams of pure melatonin. I don't know about this doctor. Matthew Walker would not suggest such high doses. He says really tiny. I can't remember the number he said, but it was like 0, 0.0 something. Um, so, but you know, he's not against melatonin. It's just, if it's helping you more power to you, but if you feel groggy in the morning, then it might be too much. You cannot enter stage three and four unless you've done the first two stages. So you might be in the first two stages in five minutes. Like there are days where I like put my head on the pillow and I'm out like a light. And that's usually that the sleep cycle, you know, I'm usually that exhausted or that relaxed maybe um, that I can just move right into deep sleep. It looks like that, but you still move through cycle one and two. It's just happening very, very quickly. It's a beautiful thing when you start to wonder about like how the body works actually. Um, so some people are like, well, I'm so anxious about my sleep that I can't sleep. <laughs> I can totally relate to that. Um, and so I would recommend that, you know, just breathe just breathe and trust your body. It knows what it needs to do. So sometimes I have to talk to myself, like, listen, Sal, like just do the best you can, you know, write down all your negative thoughts, write down things that are occupying your mind. Look at your schedule. If that's worrying you have a plan for the next day, because sometimes I'm like, Oh, I have this due and I have this due and I have this due. So I'll have like post-it notes that I might write next to my bed. And, you know, I have all these things where I'm just dumping it and saying, I got this, I'm going to deal with it tomorrow. And then I drink a lot of relaxing tea, which sort of calms me down. I might take a hot shower that day. So if I'm doing everything, just trust the body. It need, it need, it, the mind is getting in the way. Just trust the body. Keep saying that. I trust myself. I trust my body. The body will do what it needs to do. And so this is what I have to keep telling myself. So someone asked more about blue screens. Blue screens, like I said, blue screen light protectors are great. Um, on my sleep, uh, on my sleep story, I actually tell you of the um, uh, OcuShield uh, supplier in the UAE that actually I used to have to order them from the US and the UK, but just like I think during COVID, they started to have a supplier here. I don't know why I didn't think about supplying them, but actually is a supplier and, and they're like on my speed dial. Every time there's like a new device, there's like a blue screen thrown on top. So for my kids' devices, for my devices, husband devices, there's so many devices around the house. And so everybody has a blue screen protector. And of course you don't want light. You still want to dim the light 
light of your screen. You still want to put it in night mode. You still want to do all of that, but I just put blue light screen protectors on top of that. Um, so I think that's it, guys. I think I've answered all of your questions. Um, the AM PM vitamins, I found them to be very, very comprehensive. Like they are a multivitamin from like, you know, like the real deal. And so just look at the back of the box um, and you will see that it literally has thought of everything. And so the AM PM one usually is very, very, very sufficient. And I order them online and they ship directly to my house. You can go on healthy cell, um, so yeah, workouts at night, not recommended guys. Um, how long does your body need to get used to a routine or sleep time? Well, I think you need to give it, you know, depends, you need to find your groove, you need to find your rhythm. And so you are going to have to experiment with certain things and experiment with certain, I mean, I've done a lot and I've like given this sort of sleep routine, uh, that one that I recommend on, my Instagram to like friends and, you know, corporate executives and clients, and it really has worked for everyone. And so these vitamins are, you know, really medicinal grade stuff, uh, high absorption rates. They're more expensive than what you might get here and there, but they have a high absorption rate. Um, Healthy Cell now also has gels and they have a higher absorption rate. And so it's just stuff for you to consider. Um, and so, um, you will get into a routine very, very quickly. It just depends on how you find your rhythm and uh, how off your rhythm is right now. So if you live with other people who like the light, is wearing one of those light glasses enough? No, unless they're the orange ones, then it's okay. The orange ones that we walk around with at night in my house, you, um, those are really good, strong blue light protectors. But like I have blue light protectors um, that are like clear like this. And these clear ones actually don't block out as much light, but I found myself to be looking really weird <laughs> with my clients and during my talks wearing the orange ones and so dim the light as much as possible in the evening have candlelight dinners um, and then um, yeah do that so someone says what do you suggest we do when we wake up like I said first thing in the morning go for a walk get in the sun exercise <clears throat> All right, guys, I think I've answered all of your questions. If I haven't, then please message me on my Instagram account and I will see you all again, I'm sure. And um, yeah, I hope you guys have a good night's sleep. I hope you learned something. I would love to hear your feedback. Um, if there are other things that you think I could be thinking about or talking about. Um, but yeah, this is a topic that I feel very excited about. And if you guys want a good uh, recommendation for a book, it's called called Why We Sleep is a great book, super simple and like, like, you know, just top notch research coming out of the UC Berkeley sleep lab. And this is the guy who really, really just did a lot of research on Alzheimer's and dementias and sleep. And that was like his dissertation and his research passion project. So Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep. All right, guys, I'll see you guys again. Bye.